All right, we're back. So we've already had our lesson in effective speech from the undisputed master of effective speaking, Carl Baugh. And what a gift that was. But now we're going to see how Carl applies that lesson on the cosmological scale. I actually have no idea what that even means, because his rules were about how to effectively communicate your ideas to other people. It doesn't have a scale, cosmological or not. It's just basic interpersonal communication. I guess you could say the scale of your speech increases if you yell really loud or broadcast it, but that's more about the reach of your speech, not the effectiveness of it. The guidelines he proposed were about how to express yourself in a way that resonates with people, not about how to span the most distance. Otherwise one of the rules would be like, use a megaphone or upload to YouTube. Enough recap though, let's see if we can decipher what he's trying to say through his absurdly ineffective way of speaking. Now, let's apply this on a cosmological, global, and universal scale. Wow, so not only are we applying this on a cosmological scale, that is, the scale of the universe, but we're also applying it on the scale of the globe, which doesn't sound that impressive, and the scale of the universe. If the scale of the universe is big, then the scale of the universe but twice must be twice. Speech is very important. Uh, the Bible says that... Might I suggest that you don't need to go to the Bible to justify that statement? I think we're mostly on board. The speech that we receive from the heavens literally embraces all of the distance of the stars and the galaxies, and there is no place on earth where their speech is not heard, Psalm 19. Mm -hmm. So by speech then, what exactly do you mean? When you say speech, do you mean the thing that I'm doing right now, moving my mouth to make sounds that you hear, that you interpret, to understand what I'm saying to you? Or even in a more general sense, just communication of ideas, I mean, sign language, text, whatever, I'll accept all of that. If what you're talking about is the heavens literally coming up with thoughts and trying to communicate them to people, then maybe we're talking about something more or less akin to what I'd recognize as speech. But in that case, I'm not seeing much sign of stars and galaxies actually doing that. Literally, on Earth, the speech of the heavens, the vibratory information coming in, affects all of planet Earth. It affects planet Earth. It affects it in what sense? Okay, going back to your rules for a second, specifically the fourth one, which is about the purpose of speech. Effective speech has for its ultimate end the winning of response, meaning that people are going to think about what you said and possibly even literally reply to you, right? It's effective speech because it makes people go, hmm, that's a really good way to put that. I've never heard it like that before. But now you're saying that it affects the planet. So what's going on here? Are the angels like putting on a TED talk for planet Earth and planet Earth goes, what a compelling speech. That changes everything everything about the way I think. Point being, what are we talking about here, Carl? It's the same problem I had in the previous video. Are we talking about speech as being effective because it's compelling and convincing to people? You know, it's phrased well and it makes them think? Or are we talking about speech that's effective because it somehow does magic? These are not the same thing, please don't conflate them. Now, the scripture states in Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them. Okay, well that's the second kind of speech, the magical effects kind, abracadabra here's an earth, which has absolutely nothing to do with those guidelines that your speech instructor in high school told you. So if the point of this video is, look how effective God's speech is, he can create a whole universe using it. Why did you start us off talking about this other thing, which is effectively putting your ideas into words? I've always been a little bit curious how the production process of your TV show went, because it always feels like you're just winging it. Like it feels like there's no planning, you have no interest in just taking a day sitting down with your team and making sure it's cohesive, making sure that one thing follows from the next in some way. Honestly, I get the impression the way this show always worked was that you just walked out in front of the plants and over to a board that's covered in pictures that one of your interns took out of the closet, totally at random, and you just start talking and hope you can tie them all together in some way. It's like the freestyle rap of creation apologetics, and it does not work well. If I'm wrong, by the way, and if you actually put a great deal of careful planning into the show every week, or however often you did it, that makes it a lot worse. If you're going to correct me, I wouldn't recommend correcting me on this. Here we have two illustrations. One of the beatific design we see on the surface of planet Earth. Carl really likes this picture. He's used it in a bunch of the episodes that I've seen, and that's kind of what I mean about just dragging pictures out of the closet. I kind of wonder if he even knows what pictures are going to be up on the board when he walks out. Maybe it's like a game he plays with the team. They just drag out a bunch of random pictures and put them up, and he has to figure out a way to link them together live on air. Unfortunately though, although I joke about it, I don't think that's what's actually happening. I think no matter how much it seems like there isn't, there probably in fact is some kind of a plan from the start, but I don't think that they're sitting down and writing lines, I don't think there's a teleprompter, and I think that's the main problem. And all the host of the heavens, 225 billion galaxies, 
each comprised of over a half a billion stars. All of those are orchestrated with signals, and I'll describe that uh, additionally in a few moments. They're orchestrated with signals. The galaxies and the stars. Are you talking about gravity? Are you about to try to tell us that gravity is speech? All of these actually send signals that are received. Okay, well, signals and speech are different things, but I guess we're just pretending they're the same. So the galaxies and the planets are talking to each other, or to us, or to somebody, <laughs> through gravity. Is it gravity? Or is it through sound waves in the space air? Oi, Mars, you lazy fucker! Clean up your orbital path, you prick! Make me, Saturn! You can't even touch me, you're stuck in your elliptical orbit way out there! Oh yeah? You watch yourself, you little prick! One gravitational word from your father the sun and that'll all change! The, uh, the biorhythms of all living systems are affected by, and this is not astrology, this is literal astronomical data. If it's not astrology, why does it sound exactly like astrology? The biorhythms of living systems are all affected by the vibrations of the heavens. What the hell? Was this made before or after spirit science? So we have the speech of the heavens coming to us. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, okay, whatever you're trying to say, I mean, it sounds like astrology, but who knows, right now that's beside the point. But let's say I say that it's all true. The vibrations of the heavens moderate the biorhythms of all living things, and when the planets align, people turn into werewolves. What you're trying to prove by arguing for this, I think, is that these vibrations are the speech of God, or of angels, or both. Or at least just the speech of the heavens, whatever that means. But if we accept your hypothetical that there are vibrations in the heavens moderating the biorhythms of living things, that does not imply speech of anything. That implies vibrations that have an effect. Based on that, you just asserted that the heavens speak, despite presenting absolutely no reasoning for that conclusion. Vibration does not imply speech. Carl. Even literal sound waves wouldn't imply that. It does not imply a mind, it does not imply that it's trying to communicate ideas. But if we accept that it does, then... What is it trying to tell me? But that speech, as important as it is, is only a reflection of the following. We have in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3, the statement that the worlds were framed by the word of God. All right, so up to this point, we've heard zero evidence other than just your assertion that the heavens are talking to us. But apparently you consider that sufficient, so we're moving on. So what's your evidence that the totally unevidenced speech of the heavens is just a reflection of the speech of God? How is that possible? I don't know, you came up with it, you tell me. Frankly, I'm a lot more interested in if it's possible, and after that, if it's probable. Once we establish that, then I'll start to worry about how it's possible, because doing it the other way around is just a waste of my time. I received a call a few weeks ago from one of the world's leading physicists and mathematicians. Is he a physicist the way Claudia Albers is a physicist? David Otway Ray. Never heard of him, don't really care, doesn't have much relevance here. But I can only assume you're going to ramble on for a while about his credentials. Probably be about as accurate as you were about Professor John Pendleton, too. Dr. Ray has two doctorates uh, from major universities. Dr. Ray was simultaneously a member of, even though he was American educated, a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, a member of four other Eastern Bloc Academies of Science, a member of the London Royal Society, the Academy of Science for the British Empire, a major scholar, and then he returned back to America and continued research. I received a call from him just weeks ago, and he was very excited, and I said, Dave, what's going on? He said, I've just confirmed mathematically and physically what other physicists had suggested in the past, but I've confirmed that everything we see Every physical dimension that we are. Sorry, gotta stop you for one second and process what you could mean by every physical dimension that we are. Processing. Processing. Yeah, I got nothing. All the mass of the universe, the stellar bodies, the internal structure of planet Earth. I'd mock you for saying structure, but there's no point. With you, it's just a drop in the ocean. The sun, the moon, the galaxies. Every physical particle, every subatomic particle, is all the result of acoustical, vibratory 
energy. I can only assume that what you're trying to talk about is string theory. In which case, for one thing, no, he did not confirm it. If Dave wants to say he's confirmed it, let's see the experiments empirically demonstrating it. You know, aren't you guys the ones who are always like, evolution's just a theory, and you weren't there, you don't know, you're just theorizing, you don't have any direct physical evidence, and shit like that? Well, in that case, what the hell do you think string theory is? There's no direct physical evidence of the strings. They just serve as an apparently promising explanation for a few observed phenomena. That doesn't mean it's invalid, but it's not confirmed, and it's certainly not confirmed empirically. It's as just a theory as just a theory gets. But all that hyper-commitment to empiricism goes right out the window as soon as it's convenient, doesn't it? And the other thing is acoustical vibratory energy. Acoustical, Carl? That's just outright dishonest. Acoustic refers to sound, compression waves traveling through a medium. The only thing string theory has in common with this is that when people who work on it try to explain it to idiots like us, who wouldn't understand and wouldn't even want to look at the math, they use little baby analogies, like, oh, it's like a violin string something something. But that's not because string theory is about the world's smallest violin playing a sad song for you. It's because whoever's explaining it to you thinks, probably correctly, that you need it explained real simple-like. And they know it's not going to matter if it's perfectly accurate. Besides which, trying to describe something like that in speech is just not very effective. The effectiveness of speech only goes so far, Carl. That's why they have to use math. Now, did you get that? Unfortunately, yes. Acoustical sound, vibratory, Energy. In fact, it's still vibrating. I should have seen this coming, but I didn't, somehow. God's speech is super effective because Karl Baugh read an explanation of string theory for children. I've seen this kind of conflation between string theory and sound pretty often, and honestly, now that I know that's what this is, I'm suddenly feeling a lot less enthusiastic about this. There's the three degree Kelvin background radiation. Also not sound. The radiation is radiation. Light and sound are different things, Carl. I don't know why I need to say that. Which is not the result of a Big Bang or the off-scouring of evolutionary uh, dilatory processes, but instead... Before we get to the instead, really, dude? The off-scouring of evolutionary dilatory processes. I mean, to set aside the fact that you've totally broken your rule about effective speech being not for exhibition, but for communication, what you just said also just doesn't make sense. Like, by the definition of those words. I'm starting to wonder if you mistook your word-a-day calendar for the teleprompter. Also, it's real nice that you say the temperature of the universe and the cosmic microwave background radiation are not products of the Big Bang. That's all well and good that you say that, but realize that doesn't make it true and that doesn't mean people should believe you. All you seem to have in this video are assertions that you make in like two seconds and then don't even try to justify. Stuff vibrates and therefore the heavens are speaking to us. The cosmic microwave background, that has nothing to do with the Big Bang. I'm Carl Baugh and it is legitimate on the grounds that I indemnify thus. All right, back to the instead. But instead, it was found by Professor Simony, Hebrew University physicist, that at micro increments throughout the universe, there's a lattice work of electrons and positrons in concert vibration, and it is that concert vibration that provides the three degree background radiation. Never heard of this guy before, but honestly saying there's a lattice work throughout the universe of anything really? Sounds a little bit sketchy to me. Let's just Google this guy's name and electron and positron and see what comes up. Oh. Yes, I'm detecting a strong whiff of legitimacy about this. All right, this is clearly something for another time, or never. I'm not here to question the guy's research or scholarship or whatever. But it is a little funny, Carl, how you have this tendency to regularly reject the work of basically the entire scientific community. But this guy, no, he's definitely correct. No need to even ask questions about that. <laughs> But again, right, wrong, this guy is not what this video is about. These electrons, these positrons, all subatomic particles, all atoms, all molecules, all organs are vibrating from the intensity of that original spoken acoustical energy. This really is more tedious than I was expecting. I mean, you're bringing up stuff like the Kobe satellite and string theory. Stuff with real work behind it, and in the case of Kobe, real observations that it was doing. These are things that are impressive, that mean something. And then for your contribution to the scientific enterprise, if something vibrates, that means it was left over from when God spoke the universe. Oh yeah? Prove it. It kind of sucks to argue just by dismissing what you say, but there's nothing here worth any more effort. You're just saying things, asserting things. This is how the entire universe works, and I say so. I'm Carl Baugh. Insufflate. Crepuscular. And it's that acoustical energy that has provided the physical dimension, 
everything you see was not made of things which do appear. No, totally. Everything I see is made of things that I hear. Light, particles, sound, gravity, all of it. Really, if anyone anywhere anytime has ever used the word vibration in relation to anything, that's proof that it's God speaking, because vibration is a synonym for God speaking. Somehow. Huh. <sighs> I feel stupid for even making this video. You want to know something interesting? I decided to go try Carl Baugh again because there were some people who were saying, like, people talking about fake birds and Planet X were not worthy of my intellect. I think that was just about verbatim from one of the comments. And do you know what my response to that is? Have you ever actually listened to this shit? I don't know why anyone would think that Carl Baugh or John Pendleton or Kent Hovind are somehow smarter content. About the only thing that makes them occasionally harder to debunk is that they come up with all these claims from really old textbooks that you can't find the sources for. And sure, that can take time to figure out what they're talking about, and it can be a real pain trying to get a hold of the sources sometimes. But it's only rarely that it gets much worse than that. Sometimes, sure, you run into some sort of a claim that you can only understand by reading a few scientific papers, and maybe it's about a topic that's exceptionally complicated or that you don't understand. And of course, you can pretty much tell that they also don't really understand it, but you have to try to figure it out to accurately rebut it. And yeah, that can be challenging. That's true. But it's also really rare. This stuff we're talking about right now, I don't see this as being on any sort of a higher level than fake suns and fake birds. And yeah, I get it, this is kind of an exceptionally bad example of creationist arguments, but the difference between this and the average is not that great. Everything that we see is simply vibratory energy. And that is the result of the spoken word of effective speech. Oh nice, all your conflations in one convenient sentence. Vibration with speech, effectively convincing speech with effectively universe spawning speech, and implicitly assertion with argument. It's interesting when you put it all together like that though, because it makes me realize what you're actually saying is any time you see anything vibrating ever, the only reason it reasonably could be vibrating is that someone talked. Vibration implies someone speaking. After all, your entire argument is X vibrates, therefore it must be a residual effect of speech. And so, you see a basketball hoop vibrating as the ball falls through the middle? Wow, that guy standing below it must have been yelling really loud. You got some bad vibration in your muffler? There must be someone clinging to the bottom of your car screaming at it. Earthquake? Well, I did hear that couple down the street having some stern words with each other yesterday. These are the kind of absurd scenarios that your reasoning would require me to accept. For the mere existence of any vibration in the universe to have to be a residual effect of God speaking and no other possible reason, the implication is that vibrations have to be the result of speaking. Otherwise how are we deciding therefore it must be speech that caused it, and nothing else? This is absolutely ridiculous, Carl. It leads to a totally absurd universe. So, wow, there is a lot of this video left. Carl goes on for another, like, 17 or 18 minutes, and that'd be a bit much even if it was the most novel and exciting debunk material he'd ever produced. But I scanned through it, and it seems like for some reason he just descends into the most stock standard boring old creationist arguments. I guess he got tired of the speech and vibration bit. And there's no need for me to address any of that, at least no need pressing enough that I should respond to 17 minutes of content. That'd take hours. We'll end on this one. Mr. A.M. Coffee. A.M. Coffee sounds like a fake name. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, that sounds like a name you would make up for a cartoon. Like, mor like morning coffee. In the 1950s, mid-1950s, a pumper for the Gulf Oil Company was checking the area and he found nine human footprints in a trail in Permian Rock. Oh my god, Carl, do you know what this means? Think about it, man, with your head! What makes a footprint? That's right. A foot. And what must the foot do to make the print? Yes, it must step. And what is produced by the foot's step? V vibrations. And of course, we all know that if there is a vibration, it was the product of speech. So Carl, you understand. This man spoke with his feet. What a strange power. Whatever could he have been trying to tell us? I, th I think I hear it now. Sign up to the email list at list.logic.com. No, that's not it. Yes, it is. The list has over 5,000 people now. It's super popular and everyone loves it. Videos come out early there. Isn't this print supposed to be super old? Do you even know about email? Oh, right. Sorry, I forgot. Subscribe and give the video a like. Listen to my feet, damn you. I am. Listen to them. This is getting too weird even for me. I'm out of here. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time. End of foot message.